Yeah, homeboy down the, down the street does this for free and then gives me free x-rays. And he said free massage, too. It's like, dude, homeboy, I don't know what he's doing. He must not value his work. But whatever, like, I can't, I can't argue with that. And I can't argue the fact that he takes maybe insurance, too. So I, the only thing I can really do is say, like, look, you guys found me. I don't know how you found me, but you found me because you liked my stuff, probably. You probably found a podcast or video. I have a lot of people who come in from videos. So they're already sold on the idea of seeing me. Now I can choose to keep them seeing me in a different way, or I can get them to see somebody else, which then they're out of my loop. You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez, your host for the this is not the Performance Play Sports Care Podcast. This is the Restoring Human Movement Podcast. Sorry. Rebranding. Sorry. Forgot. Uh, today, we're actually going to go into something for the clinicians. And I would assume that young clinicians, as well as people who are seasoned, are going to get some stuff out of this. So I'm going to call the five tips and more in content creation because I've had quite a few interns and other docs throughout the years ask me how the hell I'm creating so much content, podcasts, videos articles and so on and how it is beneficial or not beneficial to my practice. So I thought I would go into that a little bit today and help you guys out in creating your own content because realistically, realistically, we're not going to get anywhere as uh, in regards to healthcare if we don't spread better, well-informed, newer information. And I'm really thankful for the whole concept of WebMD back in the day. Uh, they were innovative and it was great, but at the same time, like I don't know how many people come in like with a shoulder problem and think they have cancer. I mean, there there has to be something a little bit more specific or maybe well formatted for these people out there. So that was part of my mission here. And I don't know if you've, if I've mentioned to to you guys before, but one of my lasting things that I want to be able to leave on this earth is that when people start actually coming in and knowing a lot more about their condition than what their grandma told them. I would consider my job is done. So I'm trying to get that stuff out there and floating around and hopefully people see it and hear it and they're like, holy crap, maybe there's more to it than just throwing ice and rest in this type of thing. So there, uh, I didn't know food was part of it. I didn't know that I should chew my food a bunch. I didn't know that I should uh, move, you know. So that is part of my mission anyways. But So today we're going to go into those uh, five tips, the tips just off the top of my head here is number one is scratching your own itch when you're creating content. Second is knowing your target audience and basically knowing how to speak to them. Third is uh, you are you're, know that people learn in different ways. So your audience might learn in a very different way than a different person in your audience. So not everyone learns the same way. Uh, I'm more of a visual learner. Four is create an ideal relationship flow of how your people will eventually find you and experience you to make sure that you're the right person to show them the content, right? It's kind of like uh, the thing with that is it's 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 like there's great, a lot of great people out there, but not everyone needs to date each other. Not everyone gets along. So uh, part of that relationship flow is really important. Number five is uh, write better material than anyone else uh, out there. And not just writing, but I guess podcasting and videos. And if you see someone's stuff and you're like, I could do that better. If they're missing one part, make it, you know? So there's lots of parts to it there. If you're looking to uh, find the show notes on this podcast, go to p2sportscare.com, and in this one, you're going to type up five tips or content creation, and you're probably going to find this podcast, or you can actually find, I don't know, actually, I'm, quite honestly, I don't always know the titles of these things before I actually start. I have a rough idea, but I don't know the exact title, so if you go through and you actually go onto the podcast page, you'll see it playing there, or you'll see the title right now where you're playing it, wherever you're playing it, on Google play or android or itunes or whatever so just check it out um take take that title plug it in into the search function and you'll find all the show notes to it any of the references i make today in regards to links videos and so on are going to be also in that thing as well now um before i go into things again i want to make sure that you guys know a little bit about me and because i am your host you're going to experience me quite a bit if you hear these podcasts by the way if you haven't subscribed please do go into itunes also review that'd be great so one thing, actually, that I realized over the course of time was that calluses, I think, um, I mean, I think, number one, a lot of kids today are soft. They're really soft. It's like they haven't, like, picked up a bag of rice in their life and moved it. Like, they're, they're, not, hard, they're, they're not hardworking in regards to using their hands. They might be hardworking mentally, but they're, they're just, 
they're not like calloused. So one thing that I thought is like a really good reflection of someone's work ethic is do they have calluses on their hands or not? So there's quite a few times in here where in, in my in my office there are people that come in that I have them hang on a bar, I have them grip stuff, have them farmers carry, I have them deadlift. So they're like I I don't wanna I don't wanna get calluses on my hands. And like one guy even came in with gloves and I told him, Man, if you wear these gloves in here, like I want you to put those gloves in front of your face, get nice little spirit fingers there and then take a real cheesy smile and I'm gonna Photoshop that thing and put a little sparkle in your smile and hang it up on the wall. And um I, I think uh the Reverend, someone called them bitch mittens. Um, but anyways, lifting gloves, I I mean, I just want to build some calluses. You know, like I was telling, I tell every person here, especially every girl that comes in here, younger girl who's like looking to date people and so on. I'm, I'm like, honestly, I'm like, I don't, I don't think as a guy, I don't think anybody should date a girl without some type of sign of a past callus. And it doesn't have to be like the rugged, gnarly, huge calluses, or it doesn't have to be someone who did CrossFit and then he tore all their calluses up. Um, but more so just some type of density along their fingers. And this is not about physique. This is not about like working out or anything like that, because you can get calluses by digging holes. So my thought is that if, I mean, if you're going to have a partner in life, if I got to move a couch, I want someone to move a couch with me. You know, I don't want to have to call up my buddy and say, hey, come over and move the couch. I want someone to move the couch. So I think for men and women, if you do not have calluses, you are literally undateable. Okay? You need some calluses. So that is my callus rule for dating. Remember that. Tell your kids. Get them a little bit scruffed up. Now, let's get into the podcast here and all the content. Now, one of the first rules, at least for me, with content creation is scratching your own itch and... If you've heard me speak about content creation before, you're, I usually tell the story of how I started my practice and, and how I kind of went the route of trying to duplicate myself. So one of my major issues was that I had, I mean, I was a single person practice. I was renting a room from another guy. And I, I mean, I want to spend a lot of time with people. I want to show them corrective exercise. I want to show them uh, what their anatomy is all about. I want to show them all the locations of the structures we talked about. I want to show them everything. So rather than having these conversations over and over and over, I made a couple types of videos. And some of them were based upon pathology. I remember I made one on plantar fasciitis because I had a lot of people ask about what is a plantar fascia? What does it do? Where is it? Uh, What does it feel like? What are symptom patterns? Things like that, right? And I made a bunch of other types of ones too. So I made these videos where I basically took models, I did my own feet, I did skeletons, uh, and I pointed at things, and they were like five to ten minute videos. They were long, and looking back, they weren't great, but I was scratching my own itch, and I was, anytime someone would ask me, like, hey, do you do you treat plantar fasciitis? I'd say, well, yeah, sure I do. Here's a video on it, you know? So first thing it would help out with is it was basically a demonstration of what I do and do not know. Do I speak the same language of them and do I do that? Are they convinced that I can help them? Also, too, when people came and you know how it is people's first time, like they're 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 really they're concerned about a lot of que- they might be asking a lot of questions. They might not hear all the right. They might not hear all the answers. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on. And I remember when I had my dog, she had a. ACL injury or a CLL injury or CCL injury, canine cruciate ligament. And I went in there and there was a, like a four hour exam and like the, the, the doc was really thorough. She fit her up with a brace. It worked really well, but I literally had to go home and sleep and I don't remember everything there. Um, but I, I really did care about it. I wanted to ask her again on some of the facts that she told me with surgical, non-surgical and so on. But I, I couldn't, I didn't want to bother her. So if she had some of this information out there, I would love to read it. And actually, I did a bunch of uh, uh, article, re- or I, I researched a bunch of literature on PubMed about the success rates of these things. But it would be really great if she had it, or if I could hear it from her own mouth again. So I had people, I think, experiencing the same thing. They would say, hey, I, I want to I make sure I understand what we talked about last time. Can, you, can we talk about it now? And me, from like a single provider perspective, and I wasn't extremely busy, but at the same time, I didn't want to spend two hours with each person. I look, kind of look, at, I look up at the clock, and I'm like thinking, I, I got about 30 minutes here, right? Like, how do you want to burn this time with me, basically? So I'd, I'd give them the option. I was like, look, I, I made a video all on this. It's all the questions that you're asking right now. 
go watch that and then ask me if you still have questions, ask me again. But why don't we start working with your actual thing today, right? So that was a way to kind of duplicate myself. And I already knew what I said on the video was the things that I want to say. And back in the early days, I, I did a ton of takes on these videos. They weren't single single bursts, kind of like these podcasts. I don't really edit a lot of them. I just kind of go with the flow. And I think it's part of the, the realness of it. I think people like to see if you're real or not. Uh, I... And so I started with those pathology-based ones, but eventually we got to the point where people were asking, hey, how do I do this exercise again? And I remember one of the exercises, which I showed a lot of back in the day, was the cook hip lift. Uh, And there was another one too. I think I, damn, what was it? It wasn't dead bugs, but it was a floor-based one. It was a torso hip-based one. We were always all about the glutes back then. So I had people ask like, hey, you know, how do I do this? How do I do this again? Like I, I already showed them once or twice and they're still asking. And I, and I was like, look, I, I want to show you, I want to show you, like if that's part of your program right now, program today and we got nothing else to do, by all means, let's do this thing. But do you want to spend your time today going over the stuff we did last time? So not all of them want to, so they go home and look at this link that I supplied them. I would email it directly back to, or di- directly to them back in the day. I don't anymore. I actually supply my patients with a very uh, comprehensive list of of uh, videos of things that we do in the office, got exercise uh, offloader wise, treatment wise, to make sure that they have a good reference for when they're doing it at home. I don't share all these with the public, but they're certain for, certainly for patients who are supposed to be doing them. So back in the day, like these people would, would eventually catch on. They're like, oh, okay, I got that link. I'm going to watch it. And they would come back in and they would know it better. So I was scratching my own itch with this because, because I, I, all, this, all the services I wanted to provide these people, I really couldn't do it all. Uh, I was going to overstretch myself. I wasn't going to make any money. And as you know, from a practice beginning standpoint, like you want to do everything you possibly can. You do, and you have a lot of time, but you don't really want to give too give all that time because it, it's not always productive time. You got other time during the day that you, you need to go out and dr- drum up new business, right? So there's a lot of other things you could be doing. So why not just re- streamline this thing? And I actually found, too, something that helped was this really helped out with patient accountability. So rather than them coming in and saying, well, maybe I didn't get better or I did get better, let's 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 say that you were a big part of this or I was a big part of this, I can say now, did you do your homework? Did you watch that video? No, you didn't? Okay. So show it to me right now. Well, this, this, and this don't look great. Can you improve on that? Well, I didn't know how. Well, there's a video right there. You know, like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up playing sports, and I was responsible for certain skill sets. And if I didn't know those skill sets, then I was not going to play. And I do remember that there was a point in time, actually, in high school, baseball, where, I don't know, I don't know what the coach, the, the coach really wanted me to bunt. And, and I, can, I can understand it from a strategic standpoint, but he was really forcing the issue. Like, he's like, he's like, hey, I'm going to bench you until you can bunt. And I I was benched for, I think, one or two games or so, or he moved me out of position. I forget exactly. So, and I got replaced by someone else who couldn't bun either, really. And it was just kind of his way to, to teach me that I, you know, that I he's like, I really want you to be able to bun because we can get so many more uh, uh, on-base appearances and so on. Their on-base percentages will go up and whatnot. So, I got to learn how to bun. That's fine. You know, and so I was, I know, I know that I'm responsible for learning that skill set. And I know that same thing applies to patients too. They don't always seem to get it and they don't really take it as seriously, I think, because they feel better when they walk out of the office, at least with me most of the time. But also too, I know life gets in the way, but I know from high school baseball perspective, it's like baseball was life, you know, school was important too. But at the same time with you think about school, it's like you will not pass this class unless you learn these skill sets. There is repercussions for your actions, and and for this one, it's like I have this video, I have this podcast. Listen to it. If you don't, if you don't watch it and do it, and show me that you understand this part, and you're asking me these same questions again, I'll, I'll answer them. But it's going to severely chew into your your time with me doing other things. So, I I, I do I am talking I am saying that it's it's very important for a patient accountability, but also too from for me for me as a clinician. This is something that I needed that I could not afford yet. I could not afford to have someone else work for me. I couldn't have an assistant 
and actually in the beginning I didn't know I didn't know stuff well enough really even to uh, feel comfortable teaching it to somebody. I didn't know if I was doing the right things yet. I was still kind of testing the water and trying things out. So it was really helpful to do things on video of at least the things that I felt comfortable doing. Now the itch that I scratch currently is uh, comprehensive questions or small questions that turn into comprehensive answers or big old, uh, they're big talking points. And I've, I find it very often that people who are, it's, it's, I've talked to a couple of MDs about this actually, they, they, there's always the last minute question and they, there's one lady that comes in and she says, so she's a pediatrician and so the parents bring the kids in obviously and so they bring in the kid for the cough or the sneeze or the whatever and at the very end, so they're bringing this other, they have this other kid too, and they're like, oh, you know, one, one more thing. So they're always at the end of the appointment. Oh, one more thing. So my son here has this huge rash on his face, or, you know, like, it's it's always a large question, or like, hey, my, my, my son sweats at night, and he has his back pain, and he's two, or whatever. I, I'm not good at making up these situations for children. But anyways, it's like these alarming questions where it's like, oh, okay, maybe this is kid cancer, you know? So there's there's really large comprehensive topics that I think a lot of people ask the questions of that they don't realize that they're digging a really big, this is a, like a 30-minute conversation. So currently, I've made what I call the authority pages, and they're basically references that I know for a fact that I don't have to send my clients, my friends, my family to Google to say, look up, look up this word and then read about it, because I don't know what the hell is going to pop up there right? It might be completely wrong stuff. Or again, they go on to WebMD and they're like, oh, the core. Okay. It's just six pack. It's like, no, no. Then I have to undigest what they're like, a breakdown of what they already, what they already learned. So I'd rather just tell them to go to my site and say, can, can you click these word, put these words in my search bar? Or if you go to the patient, patient uh, portal area, there's all these articles where if they're listed there, they're ones that I spent literally 50 plus hours of my life writing, proofreading, researching, and citing. So there's a lot of information in there that I that I spent time putting together. And there's one in particular that, so when people ask me like, well, what is, like, do you, what do you think about core work? Like what exercise should I do? I'm like, oh, okay. So depends on your type of condition, depends on if you can tolerate flexion or extension in the spine. And I'm like, why don't we do why don't we do torso stiffness exercises and not really move the torso? And they're like, well, I don't really get that. Can you explain? So this, as you see, this can turn into a really big conversation. So here's what I say instead. I say, look, there's a search bar on my website. Type in core, and it's going to take you to a page where a girl's doing a push-up. Go through there. It's literally 30 pages on Word doc. There's more videos than you're ever going to want to watch on there. And by the end of the reading, you're going to figure out more than you ever want to know about core. It's basically the past history of core, of what people thought in the progression of now what we believe it does. And they're like, oh, cool, great. Now it's kind of on them. Like, like I'm supplying the information, and I, I love to talk to people one-on-one and, and discuss it, but at the same time, it's like, I got someone else waiting, you know, so I don't want to shut this person off, but at the same time, I do want to supply them with the information, so I get them to scratch my own itch with that. Another topic that I, I get asked quite a bit is, uh, what is it again? It's muscle tears, muscle strains, muscle injuries, gradings of muscle injuries. So they're like, well, is this a tear? And I'm like, well, there's no bruise. Well, there was never a bruise, right? No, there's never any swelling. No. Okay, cool. You have grade one. Maybe you're a grade one muscle injury. And they're like, what's that? I'm going to say, I, I'm glad you asked. I wrote a whole article on this thing. There's a whole podcast on this thing. So, and if they're a runner, I direct them to the running tip page, which has, has about 25 chapters of more information than a runner's ever going to want in regards to injuries, injury prevention, uh, questions they might have a strength training with running, and so on. So muscle, types of muscle injuries are in there. And we have that graded system from 2012 of the, um, of the 2012 consensus statement. So there's, there's all these references that I've gathered together for these patients. And it really helps me out uh, a lot with time management. Now, as you you kind of, as I kind of mentioned before, the the videos. In case you guys haven't done videos yet, I strongly suggest doing it. And I guess there's a couple ways to, to do this. I, I have a friend who used to do a demonstration for the person on their phone, so they take that video home and they have a personalized video. 
and that worked. Instead, uh, most of the time what I do is I'll write down the first time if what the person's three, four basic rehab stuff are or whatever their desensitizers are or whatever I want them to do, whatever their homework is. So I write it down in this intro, uh, intro paper, which I scan into their file. They take it home. And I, I write it down two ways. Number one, I write it down with a technical name, bird dog progression, right? And they're like, bird dog, which one's that? I said, well, good question. What do you want to call it? It's, it's where we did this and this and this. They're like, oh, I, I like that. The, the We'll call it the pointer. I said, great. Call the pointer. I'm going to put it right on your page right there. But when you go through this video reference, then I'm going to email you. It has more videos than you're ever going to want to watch. But on the left side there, I want you to go through and find bird dog progressions. That's the technical name. Now, it says progression because there's only, like, you only did one of them. Now, you can watch the entire video if you want to, but only go up to the part that looks familiar. And you're going to hear a lot of the similar cues that we use. But because you had a unique injury and we loaded it a little bit, I tweaked it a little bit for you. Do you remember that tweak? Yeah, I do. What was it? It was that. Okay, good. Cool. So this is the basic setup and to help you through it, but you have to know what you're feeling for. So you have to remember those fine nuances. So this... This video reference, at least for me, is very helpful because I only have to send one video because it's a Google Sheet. And a lot of the, vi- a lot of the exercises that I'll show are on there. If, there is not a, if there's not an exercise on there that I show, then I will typically add it later. But that's been something that's really helpful to me. Now, when you guys are creating your own content, you might want to sit there and think for a second, what are, th- what are five common misconceptions that people have? If you're making an informational-based one, what are five questions that people ask you on a daily basis that you are tired of having that conversation and you know that you can answer it better and validate it and back it up if you had all these references and whatnot behind it? Do that. Do one of those. If you find that there's five exercises that you are showing all the time and that people ask you to send a reference on because they don't remember it, do those. And you don't need anything extensive. You can do an iPhone and lo- upload it there. It's, it's fine. I remember Kelly Starrett did all these like wonky videos on YouTube, which, I mean, he, I think he was just doing a phone and people just love that shit, which is, which is fine, but we don't need big video production all the time to make an impact on people. Now, if you're anything like one of my friends where, I, where he, he loves to create content, but he doesn't have time. He's like, I can't sit down there, right? I got a couple kids. I'm like, great, cool. Why don't you dictate it? And so dictation you can talk you can speak right on the phone just like me right here or on a podcast thing you can do it on your iphone and you can send that audio file to someone to transcribe the transcription just so you know is roughly about 50 cents to a dollar a minute per recording so if this recording was a 10 minute one and can you consider how many words by the way you can fit in in 10 minutes so if this is a 10 minute recording then it would take you five dollars to transcribe nothing right Save you a ton of work in your day. Now, if you're wondering, like, well, this is going to be just it's verbatim as you're saying it on this podcast. Yeah, it will, unless you convert it. Now, I have a friend who actually, I haven't, I haven't done this yet, but I, I plan on it with a couple different things, uh, a couple different topics, mainly because there's some topics that I just literally want to vomit on paper. I don't want to proofread it. I don't want to look for grammar. And also, I have a little bit of an issue sometimes to organize my own thoughts, and I need someone else to help me out finding that, finding that direction in that system. So I have a friend who vomits on the paper, gives it to a guy who is educated about strength conditioning and anatomical uh, terminology, and the guy converts it into a really good book. So, and that's not that much either. I think it's like $150. Like, I still have that guy's email, and I'm going to plan on using him in the very near future. But, so consider that. You can have these badass references for patients for less than probably $200 per, all right? And... Everyone has different um, skill sets. You might not find someone great the first time, but I found a great transcriber. I know she's listening because you're transcribing this. So um, if anyone needs a transcriber too, email me. I'll help you out. Ronnie's great. Um, but if you're if you're making this content, it, it doesn't have to be hard and complicated. So whatever your hangups are, just identify it now, and then let's 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 take care of that. There's always a way. There's always a way to outsource. There's always a way to help. Um, it's really, really good to streamline your efforts and do the stuff that you need to do and that you're good at. 
Now, the next one we're going to go into is knowing your, number two is knowing your target audience and uh, speaking to them in their terms. Now, this is something I personally struggled with because I technically have two target audiences on this podcast if you see that. Number one is you guys because you're clinicians and I'm speaking to you in the terms that I don't think patients or CPAs or anyone else would understand or care about. Uh, and like if I was talking to a baseball player, I would I would probably identify, uh, I, w- I would speak in different terms than I would if I was speaking to a tennis player. Like they their movements, although very similar in rotation, like they have different cues and things that are different biases and come froms. So knowing your target audience and how to speak to them is very important. Now, since you guys are a target audience to me, I I've actually taken the route of attempting to get you guys to share with the secondary level audience. And if you've heard some of the other generalized podcasts, non-continue education podcast style of thing, then you're going to recognize this because I always say share it with your patients. Now, I consider you the influencers. So you are really the primary target on this because you're the influencers to show and share the information to your tribe. Now, The things that you would share with your tribe are not necessarily things that you'd share with a friend who's another clinician. So when I create things that are easy for patients to understand, easy for lay public to understand, I say them in in different ways. I try to do a little bit more analogies, and I don't talk specifics of anatomy unless I clarify, because I don't need to clarify to you guys quite as much. So identify your target audience and where where they are at as well. So where are you guys? I tend to think that you guys are very much like me, I'm guessing. So I'm busy throughout the week. I don't have time to always have a conformed, consistent schedule to listen to or watch something. So if someone says, show up to this webinar at Wednesday at 2 o'clock, I wouldn't make it. Like, I think I might might make it, but I probably won't. So I might want a recording. And so all these podcasts are recording. You can literally binge listen to all these things and... I make them available to you, and I keep reminding you on different days. And where do you, where do you people hang out? Where are you at? You know, I think it's funny that, like, I think there's actually, I think about Instagram. I don't love Instagram because I don't really love social media. I don't, I don't, I don't love that stuff. And as you can tell by some of my posts, like I, like I, I put effort into it, but I don't do them daily. And you guys, I mean, I, if you follow people like me. You probably see on your Instagram and your social media more chiropractors lifting weights than anything else. Like I subscribe to one hashtag. It's Ula. It's fishing. And because I like to see something in the middle of, of just dudes lifting weights. And like, so I know where you guys are hanging out. You're probably on Instagram. And you might not hang out on podcasts. I don't know. Uh, but I know that I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't spend a lot of time personally reading a, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a lot of time reading on Wikipedia. Like you guys aren't on Wikipedia. You're, you're, you're probably not on Reddit. You're probably not on Facebook. Although Facebook, you're probably in Facebook groups. So I need to, my point is that when you are identifying your target, where's that target hanging out? I did a, I did a presentation at uh, SCU recently and we were talking about YouTube videos and one guy said, well, I'm going to target, um, I think he said like, I want to say it was like older geriatrics. We were talking about geriatrics. He wasn't very specific with the gender, age, uh, and um, I don't know, race, whatnot, and or activity levels, any of that stuff. I said, geriatrics, okay, so what age group? And they're like, oh, like 70, 80. I said, great, cool. So I said, where are they hanging out? You know, like, do they watch YouTube videos at all? Like, my grandpa could not, like, he could barely call you. Like, my dad could barely use an answering uh, an answering machine when I was growing up. He couldn't even put a, like, he would have us start his DVDs in his DVD player because he didn't understand how to play it. He just was not an electronic dude. So, are, where are you people hanging out? Like, if you're targeting geriatric people, like, you, you, might, you, you might not even have a podcast or a... Like perhaps, perhaps the articles, like you, your block text, like your paragraphs are too big and it just confuses them or like their eyesight is an issue, right? They might not stare at monitors. Like I know, I know older people who they get confused getting into their emails and there's nothing against them. 
It's just that they're not hanging out there. So maybe is content creation even right for you? You may, maybe you got to hand something to them. Maybe you need to be where they're at physically. Now, I know that for me, for me, if I was someone's target market, like I do not drive very far to work. So I don't get a chance to really engage too much with podcasts. But when I do travel, I do listen to them and I listen to them on airplanes. So I remember there was this one coffee podcast that I was so on to listen to. I downloaded all their all their podcasts before I got on a plane. And I got on there and I heard the hum of the engine. And then the podcast was kind of like this. It was so, so quiet. And I had to cover my ears a little bit just to see if I could you see if I could hear it better, and I couldn't. I was struggling to hear this thing. So their target market, I don't know if it was me flying an airplane, but their audio needed to reflect the environment that I was gonna listen to it in. Like it wasn't good enough. Like I'm hoping to God that my 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 podcast is is the only media that you're listening to is audio. I hope the audio is good enough. And I used to record in my cars or my car when I was driving, and I realized that wasn't good enough. So I got I went to a better mic and whatnot. So know where your people hang out, know how old they are, know how young they are. Uh, what do they want to hear about? And I think this is a big part, actually, because your target audience is like, in all honesty, like they do not, like if you're, if you're targeting videos, they do not care about what your name is. They don't care what, if you're a clinical director. They don't care about your education. They don't care about that at all. And rightly so, because they're on there to hear about what they want to hear about. And I've listened to quite a few podcasts where like people are rambling through for the first five minutes or so. I know my intro is five minutes, by the way. Um, but they but they ramble through about, they're kind of just going around in circles, right? And I still don't know yet what the topic really is. I saw the title. I'm like, I know they're going to get to this right now. But I want to get something meaty, some type of hook in the beginning, so they're rambling through a little bit, and I just hit 15 seconds, forward, 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 until I hear a second voice and I rewind. So I'm a little bit more invested because I want to hear what that main topic is. But at the same time, if you notice my intros, they've changed. They've changed, and I'm trying to drop a little bit of a snippet of what you're going to get in the beginning, as well as framing it. Who should be listening to this? What is it, and what are you going to get? And then I'll go into little bits and parts about me. So... Know, know what they want to hear about because you guys are here on here not to really hear about me. I mean, I want to share little parts about me just so you know who I am and you're a little bit more connected to me as as the presenter. But at the same time, like you care about you, which is fully okay. And your patients care about them. They don't care about you quite as much. So don't always tell them about what you want to tell them about. Tell them about what they want to tell about and there's little parts that you drip in there. And I don't want to call this like a bait and switch. And like when you look up with Google keyword search, you figure out, let's just say knee pain with runners or knee pain. Let's just say knee pain. You're going to find that there's lots of knee pain. uh, People are looking at knee pain stretches, knee pain exercises, knee pain flexibility, knee pain mobility. They're looking up all these different things. And your topic might you like you're like, "Ah, I'm, I'm not I'm not down with stretching the knee, especially if it's unstable. Right. And. It's if you do not give them what they want, they will not open your video. They will not open your podcast. They will not not open your article. So I learned this from writing from bodybuilding.com a little bit is that I, I, there was a, there was a couple articles I wrote. I'm like, these are badass articles. Like I love these, like these are, these are ones that I'm really proud of. And I was even proud that I narrowed it down since I tend to be very, uh, long winded on articles. So, they came back to me and they're like, no, oh, this isn't good enough. And I was like, what the hell? Why? So I, I, I changed it. I changed it a little bit, the framework. And, and we called, one of them was called, uh, I think it was like five deadlifting tips uh, to not hurt yourself in the gym or something like that. I forget what. And they're like, oh, that's so much better. And I remember I wrote one that it was like, I literally sat down and wrote for about 45 minutes, didn't edit it, sent it over there. And it was the the three exercises in the gym that will hurt your back and how to modify them. And they loved it. They loved it. It's because it was catchy and it had a hook. And it's what people are looking for, at least in their target demographics and their target audience. Now, I could have spit all day about um, lumbar spine disc and facets and all that kind of jazz. But that's they they they're. They're a big company. They understand 
what their audience wants better than we do. Like we're terrible business people. Like I think I'm okay, but they're badass. Like they've they're they got a probably a multi multi million dollar, maybe billion dollar corporation or company online. They're better than us. They know their stuff better. So make sure you're meeting people where they're at and talking about the things that they care about. Now, how do they find their information? I I think I spoke I spoke about that a little bit. So I'm going off a bullet point here. Where do they find their information and where they find where are they going to find your information? I I heard the term back in it back uh, months ago and I think this is where my I think my uh, my titling and my direction of people on content got a little bit better was that I used to just publish and pray and then hope someone would find it. I would hit, hit the publish button and just let it ride. Just let it go on the internet, let it go on YouTube and see what happens. And actually, if you followed my the progression of some of my videos in the beginning of the year, I was doing a video a day. And what I found that by doing these videos was that I was not actually doing a job of promoting them and placing them in the location where the person, the intended audience would find it. Okay. Promotion of these videos and your stuff is extremely important. And once you publish the article or the video of the podcast, that's only part of the battle. And so any guests that I have on here, like I ask them, please share with your audience. Your audience loves you, right? I'll share with my audience and the people that, that, that follow me. But then how do we reach beyond that audience? You know, and I, if I did, if I said interview with, um, in, interview with Sebastian Gonzalez, probably no one's going to care because again, that's about me, right? Maybe podcast interview with Sebastian Gonzalez teaching you the three worst exercises in the gym and how to modify them. Oh, cool. That's a little bit more about me, right? As as the as the as the end listener. So I think putting things in the place where people will find them, like a little Easter egg hunt is more important actually than writing content. But I can tell you this, and I've had a lot of people ask me like, where do I start with content? Well, make your content, make it. Do you have words? Do you have, do you have, do you have audio? Do you have video? You have none of it. Then you have nothing to promote, nothing. So start writing, scratch your itch. Like that's why I put scratch your itch as number one, scratch your itch, figure out what you need to be speaking about and what your people want to hear about and what makes your life easy. After that, then you have to know where your target audience is and start directing that, directing your information into that group if they're allowed in there. By the way, there's lots of hangups and like people don't want to be promoted to, whether it's good for them or not. Like you put something into someone's Facebook group and they they will lose their mind. It's like don't don't promote yourself on our group. And it's like I'm I'm giving information. I probably didn't even mention my name in the beginning of the video. Like hey, chill out, man. Like I know I know a couple of running forums were like this where I posted some videos in there. Um, and in some articles, they were like the authority articles that I said, the, the ones that I felt very proud of that I felt were better than anyone else's on the internet. And they, they, they came back, they're like, you can't link to yourself. I'm like, what? What are, what are you talking about? I can't link to myself. And I said, what do you want me to do? And actually I did a whole podcast. I did a whole podcast this on this cause I was so fired up at the time. They're like, they're like, well, you need to write as if you're one of the peers of the group. You can't write as an authority. And I'm like, but I can't, I mean, I kind of have an advanced degree and I'm like, so I'm like, what you're telling me is that you want me to regurgitate the entire article on your blog or on your forum. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like I've already, like I've already spent so much time doing it where I'm not going to do that. So they can just go to my link. And, but the funny thing is if someone else can share your link and it's okay, this is, this is an odd part about the whole thing. And actually I just barely went through, I was, I was going through Wikipedia cause I do like to add some advanced information on Wikipedia because they get outdated too. And they're actually written by people. They're written by peers. They're not, there's not a single moderator, just people add to it. I don't know if you guys knew that. So you can submit things there, but you have to cite it. Everything, every single thing you cite. And so I went on one of them and I put in some of the facts about radiology findings regards to lumbar spine pain and correlation to back pain or not. And so the moderator in there, there's moderators in all these things. And so he's like, cool, great. Like, where's the citations? And I cited some level one research. He's like, cool, great. Where's your secondary level stuff? And I'm like, oh, I didn't know you wanted secondary, but cool. I will. I will. Great. So I was digging around and I was like, I don't, I was looking on Google because he want secondary level was, uh, it was basically someone citing the article or summarizing the article 
So the way I read it was like, oh, a blog or a book. Great, I'll find one. So I was digging around. I'm like, I don't like anyone's summary of this article because the article was fairly new. And actually, so it was a meta-analysis, a systematic review. So it was really good research. So I don't know why we wanted a second one. But anyways, so I, I'm like, I already wrote about this. So like I already read this entire article and I cited it on my page in a certain section. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to take a gamble, but I know, I feel like I know what's going to happen. So I provided my link and then I provided another one of a book that I've not read that it was a PDF on Google, which kind of highlights it. It highlights the areas of the book where it kind of is, right? You can't even like, I'm not going to buy this book just to say cite Wikipedia. But so I got an email back and, and he was like, cool, the book reference sounds good. And I thought, dude, like you're making this so hard. Like I already wrote... Like, I don't know how old this book is. It's probably about 10 years old for, or, eh, it probably can't be 10 years old because it's, it's newer research, um, newer, about five years, I think. And like, I, I, I don't even know what they're saying about it in there. So I have a hard time like citing it. I just knew that I'm like, oh, it's a book. They're citing this thing. I think it's probably going to be okay. It's a radiology book. So well, let's just let's just go with it. And he took the one that was basically not mine that I can 100% trust. And, I, and I, I recognize that I could have written things poorly in there, and I might change it over time. But at the same time, I know it's very, it's very frustrating to put your information in front of the people that you're trying to put in front of it. And, and Wikipedia is not my target audience, but I do like updating in there. But if I was, again, if I'm putting them in those running forums, it's like, dude, cite, cite the work. Like, I don't want to cite, like, Joe Schmo's blog about, like, his his experience running his first Ironman and then saying that putting salt on his eyeballs really helped out with his endurance. Like I like it's, it's just someone's interpretation of it, like a lay public interpretation. Like, so it's, whew, I got to cool down. I get, I get hot on the hot on these topics. So anyways, put your stuff where people are at and, um, yeah, we'll go on to the third one now. Cause I can talk about that all day as you can tell. Now, the next part, number three, is just knowing that people learn different in different ways. And I actually, uh, Dr. Kevin Christie, Christie asked me this in the podcast. He On his podcast, it's it was um, a modern chiropractic marketing show. And he, he asked how I create content. And I realized that when I'm writing an article, I, I know there's certain things that need to be seen, right? And... I realize I got to make some videos. And so when I make those videos, I realize there's some things that need to be written. And so I link it back to the page. And I realize that some people won't even read this entire thing, but they want to listen to it, which is fine because I listen to book on tapes. I don't read any books unless they're clinical books or business books and whatnot. I, I listen to them when I'm driving or flying. So people learn in different ways. And if you've been working with people in regards to corrective exercise, you'll... I know that I've 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 experienced this. I'll be standing in front of them. And my right is my and my right is their is their left. Um, excuse me. My right is their left. And I usually frame it and I say, if I was your mirror, move as I do. And I move my left arm, and they move their left arm as well. So they're no longer mirror image. They're in tandem. So at that point, I, I kind of take a gander at them. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to turn then, and uh, you follow me this way. If I move my left arm, you move your left arm. And I kind of got to look through the mirrors in the office to, to see what they're doing, make sure they're doing it well, and then I'll fall back and just, once they learn the choreographed part. So people learn in different ways. Visually, people learn in different ways. Audio, people learn in different ways. And I know that even in this podcast, I could probably do a better job right now of instead of lecturing my experience with you guys, maybe I just sit here and say, how do you learn? And sit here and just be blank for a little bit. And you sit there and think. So that's more of like, a, I think, a workshop type of way. So everyone, everyone learns very different. I tend to think that since I'm, my target audience are people that are fairly similar to me. And the reason why I, the reason, the reason why I, I target people that, that think and, and learn like me is because I understand how they would like to be spoken to. And I don't, I don't necessarily know everything about them. I do know I need to learn a little bit more about my target audience, but I, I feel like I learn better through story. So 
a lot of times I try to drop in stories and similes and metaphors. And, and when you even think about cueing, too, it's like you, you pick things that people are, are familiar with, with seeing and understanding. Uh, Dr. Stuart McGill did a great job with doing this with people who have played sports. And you, you say, like, hey, can you hip hinge? And you teach it. Or you just say, hey, do you ever play shortstop second base? Cool. Slide down, get in that position right before the pitcher releases the ball. And then they already have it, right? They're they're going back to something they're, they've they've done a lot. So people learn in very different ways. And I would I would probably ask them first. I don't always do this, but ask them what they want, how they want to learn. Would you rather see a video, an article, or a podcast on this? And the great thing about content creation is that if you're very thorough with it, I'll, I like to think that I'm thorough with it, but I'm sure I could do a better job too is that when I create an article, I realize that I'm now so well-versed in that one topic, or at least the way that I learned it, that I can probably speak about it for a while. And all the articles in there, I can probably reference roughly the sample sizes, the outcomes, uh, the limitations, and so on. So, And I could probably do the same on a podcast and a video, and if I've been demoing the exercises or the corrections of, let's just say, the core one, if I've been demoing those core exercises for a while, I'm very I'm going to be very quick at cueing them. So you're not necessarily relearning multiple things. You're learning one thing really well, and you're presenting it different ways. And this will take this can actually take a very long time uh, not to learn the stuff. Actually, well, it could take a long time. This one re, uh, rotator cuff article, by the way, that I wrote on my page, it took me three months to write, and I think I have over fifty references in it. Because I kept digging these rabbit holes. I kept figuring out, I'm like, ooh, that's interesting. Let's look at something on that. Ooh, that's interesting too. So I'd end up citing a bunch of things, kind of like Wikipedia, like every line had a citation on it. Um, so these things can take a long time to write, but they did, they don't necessarily take a long time to learn. And repurposing these things, the the first one takes a long time because you are learning it in the process of writing it and you're digesting it. But after that, it comes much quicker. So... If you're wondering how I produce a podcast a week, a video a week, and I don't do articles all the time. Articles are once every couple months or so, but I do write free video courses or email courses. I do write, uh, I just finished a 150 page ebook. Uh, I have, um, there was another ebook, which is, it was on ulnar neuropathy that was about 130 pages. So these are all things that, uh, Actually, I should back up. I like writing, so I don't mind it. Every morning, I spend about two hours writing or so. I don't like editing, so I have a team of people for that. But in regards to like your first article or your first video or your first topic, figure out, scratch your own itch, what do you always need to talk about? What do you want people to learn more than anything else? Speak in the terms that they understand and ask them, what do you want to hear about? What do you want from? What do you want to learn from me? Maybe even do a multiple choice question. Uh, do you want to learn about low back pain, shoulder pain, hip pain, knee pain, and uh, write a leave a blanketed area right there and just just, just say ask ask me a question. And these are all uh, subject subject matter that you can add to it. So just start with that, and then you can start repurposing that content. And I think you're going to be extremely excited and happy about how it uh, how your patients respond to it because it is it is a lot of work and time you put in for them. And I think they see that, and they see that you're doing more than any other doc that they've ever seen before. I mean, you wrote that right for them, right? Specifically for them, in the terms that they understand how badass. Like, you're a killer doc. Like, you care about your patients. So that is um, just understanding that people learn different ways. Next, we're going to go into the ideal flow of how people kind of interact with you and, and reach you. And I actually learned about this recently when I had a patient that actually, she came in after about two years after really experiencing some of my content. And I remember interacting with her a bit on Instagram and she had asked about a hip flexor issue with running. And I said, great, cool. Here's an article I wrote on it. It was one of the authority pages, which I mentioned earlier. And I didn't hear back from her, her again, or I didn't hear from her again. Lo and behold, she actually went through and called the office and asked about insurance and do we take it? And the answer was him haw around. We didn't actually say no at that time. So that kind of turned her off. Um, but over the course of time, she experienced the content a little bit more. 
And when she finally came in, I sat down and talked with her about the experience over the last couple of years of trying to get in, or at least us missing the opportunity of getting her in. And she said she'd called a couple times. She never really interacted with me, but she experienced the content um, and even even bookmarked the page that I had suggested to her. I was like, did you ever read the page? And she said, no. And uh, I, it kind of brings up the thought of like how, even though you create all this content, how are people experiencing it and, and digesting it? Are they reaching it at the right point, at the right time in their life where they're actually ready to make that jump into your office? Now, I learned a little bit more about this as I started to develop digital media, uh, ebooks, e-courses, and so on. But realistically, I mean, so we call this the funnel. And But realistically, when it comes to any person's interaction with you, it doesn't always start with, right away with you speaking to them and walking up to them. And you can probably, like, I like to think of this uh, whole experience of, of working with people as kind of like a dating process. They're, they're kind of similar. They're very similar. So when someone walks into the room, you look, you turn, you see them. Are they smiling? Are they picking their nose? And so on. And they walk up to you and you already have some type of impression of them. So when people interact with your office, what is the first touch point that you have with them? And what are the touch points along the way? So obviously it's not something you can completely control unless you develop a nice funnel through it. Now, pretty soon we're actually going to, uh, for a couple different conditions, what I, I decided what I wanted to do was to get people to experience the media that I created throughout the course of time in a very precise way. And the only way I can really do that is if I know their entry point. They might know me as a person, but they the entry point and where they get into an email funnel is where I start to can, can kind of cater the content that they get. An example would be is we're about to launch a Facebook ad fairly soon. I don't know if it'll be up by the time this whole thing starts here, but there's there's a lot of runners around my area, and I've treated a lot of runners over the years. And and um, just on the note of if you kind of go back into number two is who's your target audience? I I didn't know who my target audience for, was for a lot of years, and I would see baseball players, softball players, runners, triathletes, weekend warriors. I never really saw um, I don't want to say just obese people, but people who were deconditioned. I didn't see a ton of people who were just like not ambitious of exercising. So I did see mainly active people, but you can narrow that down even a little bit more. So with this campaign, what we're going to do, which I think a really good target for me is tightness or quote unquote tightness of a hamstring single side of a runner. And since we do have a lot of races around here, people train all year, it's nice weather and so on. But You'd be surprised how many people just have this quote-unquote tightness of a hamstring or calf, which that can narrow down and do a calf uh, campaign later. But they they think this calf thing is just never going away because they foam roll it, they stretch it, they try to massage it. It just never goes away and always comes back partway through their run, worse in the morning. So possibly with these, we're looking at radiculopathy or some type of nerve-based condition, right? So what I want people in this instant is I want them to be able to experience my content that is specific for that one type of condition with uh, me kind of catering it better for them. I'm curating it for them so they don't randomly jump around my page because they don't know what they have. They don't know what the reason for the hamstring tightness is. So they might look onto a hamstring strain portion of my site and then look about look up all the stuff about scar tissue or remodeling and grade two tears and how to rehab a hamstring and so on. And might not, and that might not be the right thing for them. So I need to cater this or curate it for them. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to make a Facebook 15 second video ad. And it's going to be very close to something like, hey, have you do you have chronic hamstring issues that are not reduced with stretching, foam rolling or tissue work? try these two different exercises and we're basically going to take them into a McKinsey extension or wall slide type of thing and what I'm looking for in that is that obviously this is a video that I've already made uh, and a lot of the videos throughout this entire the e-course that I'm speaking about are already made and I've already I've already done a lot of the the text as well or the copy we call it uh, on different pages so it's stuff that I've already put together now I'm just blending it into the exact condition that they should be experiencing it in so they're going to they're gonna go through and test, retest after that McKinsey extension. They're going to be like, holy shit, this thing got better. 
I've been trying to stretch and foam roll this thing for years and it just, just is not working. What the hell? What else does this guy have, right? So already there, if they don't know me already, that is the first moment they met me and they experienced a fruitful, valuable lesson. Now they want more. So in my office, we actually have a very high uh, initial exam fee. I don't like saying prices over the over podcasts or social media at all, but for the most part, I would say we're at least two times or more higher than most people in my area. And we cannot combat with people who call and they're like, hey, uh, how much for your exam? And we're like, well, it's around this much. And they're like, ooh, yeah, homeboy down the, down the street does this for free and then gives me free x-rays. And he said free massage too. It's like, dude, homeboy, I don't know what he's doing. He must not value his work, but whatever. Like I can't, I can't argue with that. And I can't argue the fact that he takes maybe insurance too. So I, the only thing I can really do is say like, look, you guys found me. I don't know how you found me, but you found me because you like my stuff. Probably. You probably found a podcast or video. I have a lot of people who come in from videos. So they're already sold an idea of seeing me. Now I can choose to keep them seeing me in a different way or I can get them to see somebody else, which then they're out of my loop. And I probably won't help them again for a very long time after they've failed care somewhere else. Or maybe they succeeded and they just still want to come back and see me. Who knows? But so anyways, I have the opportunity at that point to say, well, look, I have this e-course online. You can go through. It's all right on my page under courses. And you go through and you're going to get basically a strong majority of the things that we cover in the first couple times of your of your care here. Now, I'm not telling you you don't need to come in, but if you're not sold on the idea of actually seeing me and thinking that my prices are worth it, that's a small sample into what we're going to do. So that is the way for them to, again, build value in who I am and the content and the uh, the examination process and the, and the type of solution I can give them. So throughout that, actually, there's a little bit of a purchase uh, opportunity for them, too. They can buy something for about $7 and then something again for $50. And then, lo and behold, the high price for the exam is not that big of a deal anymore, I think. I mean, I can tell you, at least from my perspective, and I think I've said this on a couple other podcasts, is that I would easily, easily pay uh, the expert of, let's see, what kind of condition do I have right now? I would easily pay uh, Stuart McGill, you know, thousands of dollars to be able to talk to me over the phone and, and guide my care rather than fly over uh, and so on. But I'm sold on the concept of his idea. You know, I'm sold on the idea that he can help me and that's what's going to help people come see you. And that's why building content, doing videos, podcasts, and these big articles are helpful. Now, just like it, in, so in this number four is is figuring out how the relationship flow will go. I, I first first off, like I said earlier, is you cannot promote and curate content unless you have content. So make content. Do you know do you know where to start? Don't know where to start? Figure out the things that people are asking you all the time. Figure out the conditions that always walk in your office, and what are the top five things you want to show them. And at that point, you can start building this little ladder, or this little funnel of how they're going to experience your content. So that's something we're actually working on a lot right now, and that's the reason why I'm creating so much digital media, uh, so many videos. So many uh, ebooks too. I I think everybody at some point is at some point they're injured. They're not really ready to go see somebody, so they're going to be searching online for something. And I might as well be one of the ones to give them the correct information, or at least what I believe the correct information. Obviously, I can't examine them. Obviously, I can't administer their care. But you can re- you can read a book. I mean, crap. Like I've I've played the stock market reading a book a book for dummies. I lost a little bit of money, but at the same time, like it it educated me more about what's going on. So I think we can do the exact same thing there without overstepping our healthcare boundaries of administering care, without having a um, uh, without having much liability there. And just on a personal note too, we I've already I paid thousands of dollars for a disclaimer to be made for my stuff. So I would strongly suggest, I'm not an attorney, but I would suggest that you guys do that to cover your ass because I don't know who decided at one point that saying don't do this unless you've been uh, seen by a medical doctor was good enough. But wherever that started, how do we know that person did, the, did their deal? Dude, ew, God, I'm suffering today. Um, how do we know that person didn't do their due diligence? We don't. So, Or at least I don't. I don't know the origination of that. So I just paid somebody because I want to make sure that I'm not hanging my ass out to dry. 
Now, the last one, number five, is just write better content or produce better material than anyone else that you know. And honestly, I don't know a lot of uh, my classmates who created a lot of content, but I have a lot of seen, I've seen a lot of people who have created content, and it's great. There's some that are amazing, amazing content, and you're, and I'm even thinking, they gave this shit out for free? Like, why? It's crazy. Like, and I, I had an intern actually coming through that he's like, I don't know why you charge for your, why don't charge for your web pages. They're massive. There's a lot of stuff on them. And I said, well, I, I think I got more to share. So maybe I'll charge them for the follow-up stuff. But also, too, when they're on that page, they're already the, they're experiencing me. They're experiencing my ability to help them. They're seeing that there's hope. So those are just promotional material for me. I personally don't go out and market a ton to coaches, MDs, orthos, and like I, I don't I don't want to buy their office lunch. And I remember one one guy did that to me the first time, and we were co-managing a patient, and homeboys like. Yeah, or the it was the office manager, actually. She said, yeah, you can speak with him if you buy the whole office lunch. I'm like, I just referred you a patient for a consult. I can't talk to dude. I can't talk to him to uh, figure out what's going on. I, I, I'm i not going to refer you anyone else ever again. But uh, at the same time, it, it really frustrated me where I don't like going out and uh, dealing with that kind of thing. I, I just want to make sure that I have the best content on my site. That's why I can direct him back to my site. So I... I've looked at other people's stuff, and I've, I've looked at WebMD, I've looked at Wikipedia, and I, I get really frustrated. I got really frustrated, and I bitched, and I complained, and I thought, why doesn't someone make better stuff? And then I thought, why not me? Why not me? So rather than BS about it, I'd rather just make legit stuff. And for the most part, too, I, I realize that content creation is really tough, it's hard. It's hard to make a three or a uh, thirty-page Word doc article and format it and put pictures on and videos and organize it and then make it pretty. These are hard to do. So looking back, like I, I recognize how hard it is for people to put content out. So I try not to be the one who complains anymore about someone's material if they made the material themselves. If they copy and pasted someone else's, like. Like that wasn't any effort, man. Like you, you got to put some original stuff out and give something back to the world. But content creation is tough, and it's really easy to criticize. So uh, if you put out any content, send it to me. I want to read it. I'm curious, and I'm really thankful for the founders who put stuff on to the web. And maybe it wasn't the best content. Maybe it was harder back then. Who knows? I know that my website is much easier to navigate now than it used to be. So. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want you to think that I'm I'm complaining about other people's content uh, in regards to them not making an effort. I just think that I just think that I could have added to it, so I did. I remember one thing just recently, actually, is I have I really tried to improve on the lower cross syndrome uh, image, and what I typically do with a lot of patients, I've done this with trigger points, I've done this with lower cross, upper cross, and I'll go through on my phone or on my computer at the office. And I'll type up lower cross syndrome pictures on on Google, and it pulls up all this stuff, which I think they're I don't I don't think they're that good or descriptive for a patient. Like I understand what's ta- what they're talking about from a clinical side, but it's like literally a pelvis with an X through it, and then letter or words written on the side. I think it could be better. So rather than bitch about it, by the way, thanks guys for putting that up originally. Uh, I made a picture. I drew a picture of that and added to it. And to note on that, since the only reason I usually show this is because people will bring up the, the thought of like, I have piriform syndrome. I have impingement syndrome. I have hip flexor syndrome and all these syndromes, facet syndrome. I thought, and this is the next article I'm going to make because I, I don't see anything else out there on it, is how these syndromes correlate to the tonic phasic group, how it t- correlates to Yonda's work. And so with this, I took that picture. I didn't copy it, I, but I made my own anatomical model. I made the dials and the arrows just like before. And then I made uh, injections in each spot, kind of like if you think about a comic strip. I got one into the hip right there saying hip impingement. This happens because of X, Y, and Z. And we went into 
tightness of the low back. This happens because of X, Y, and Z. And I put about six different things on there that I commonly speak to patients about. And now I print it out and it actually came today. I print it out and made it into a picture and I have it right on the front desk. So when people say like, well, I have this syndrome, what's going on? Like you, you checked me out for torso stiffness. Why? Why? How does this correlate to my syndrome? Great question. So now I don't have to go through my phone anymore and then think, ah, you know, here's a picture of it, but there's a lot more to it. Instead, now I have a picture and pretty much all of it's there. So just to reiterate, make better material than anyone that you know. And that's the best one that I've found for the purpose that I have. So if you're looking to make stuff better, do the research and make it better. It might take a long time, but you're solving a lot of people's problems. And back to the original thing is solve your own problem. Scratch your own itch. It's going to be really helpful in in the development of systems later, and you're going to have a better lasting impression on the earth, I think, by helping out more docs just like you. Now, just a couple secrets, uh, extra secrets of content creation that I, I've shared with a few friends is I know that a big issue is people don't have time. Uh, they have kids. They have a busy practice. I get it. I got it. Like I only work like three and a half days a week with patient care. I work long hours with it, but at the same time, it's that's all by choice because I love con- creating content. So at the same time, though, I don't like spinning my wheels and doing things that are small if 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 I'm not good at them. So I use outsourcing with some things, and that's how I create a lot of these things that you're hearing, seeing, and, and viewing. So I have a friend, I, I called him up, and he's very tech savvy, and he makes great videos. And I said, hey, man, why don't you just, you need to write some articles to kind of repurpose that video into an, into an article and then drop it in there and embed it. Put it on your page, it'd be great. And he's like, well, I don't have time. I got the kids and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you can, trans, you can have it transcribed. Just speak in your phone. Transcribe it. What's the problem with that? And he's like, oh, it's a good point, and, uh, and maybe they won't pick out the him ha's and ums, and because I have these transcribed, and some, it's not always good sentence structure because it's conversational, which is fine, because then you can have a ghostwriter. And I think I mentioned earlier that you have someone, or I, I know someone who literally vomits on paper, sends it out to a guy who is really good at writing and reorganizing thoughts. He sends it back, he approves it. That is it. That is the article. Perfect, right? And for the cost on those, I mean, audio dictation is not a lot. Um, Ghostwriting or having someone re- re- reorganize your thought is is not a lot either. And you, if you figure out the bottlenecks then, what are the things that take most of your time? What's the biggest hang-up? Are you concerned about the transcription or, or the writing of it? Are you concerned about the, the website formatting? Do you not have pictures? Do you want videos? Hire someone out for these things. The only things that you can really do The things that you have to do is that you have to present who you are and your information. So I know that I have to do this podcast. There's no one else who's going to do who's going to do this podcast in my voice, in my way, with my content, with my thoughts. No one's going to. So I got to do it. But I don't need to edit it. I do edit it because it's very quick for me. I used to not. um, But I had someone uh, leave the team. So I decided to pick that up. But that doesn't mean I won't just farm it out a little bit more later. Uh, with videos, you have to do the videos. You have to be there. You have to know what you're going to say. You have to be smiling. You have to be personal. You have to tell the people what they want to he- what they what they want to hear, and then tell them what you want them to hear. But you don't need to edit it, right? You don't need to set up a lighting kit. You don't need to actually have the vi- the camera. Um, you don't have to do any of that part. And I I have a friend who he I think he paid under a thousand bucks to get a ton of videos done. They did all the editing and whatnot. It looks great. It's 4K. So that's another option too. I personally video all mine. I have a lighting kit in the office. I set up a tripod. I have a GoPro. And sometimes uh, when I have an intern or a front desk person at the office, I say, hey, here's what I'm looking for on this. I'm going to blow through this thing really quickly. I want this and this and this in the frame. Watch out for glares. So I know what I'm, I know what I'm looking for. And probably two, uh, one thing we should probably talk about is format of making content is, this is a tough one. And it's a tough one. It was a tough one really for me to figure out for a very long time because I tend to think that we don't need to be creative with our writing and speaking and video production and you can't have bait and switches and all this uh, clickbait and whatnot, but realistically, you kind of do. You kind of do. 
And this is why you see all those girls on Instagram getting all these followers. They have clickbait. They're really good at putting thumbnails on, right? And even some of the people who are very are great clinicians and they've done very successful on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, they have great thumbnails. They have clickbait. And if you listen to them, you're going to hear that probably in the beginning, I know I do this now, is that I tell the person that they are in the right place and what they're going to get from it. An example is in this podcast is if you're a clinician, you're in the right place. I'm going to show you five tips on how to produce your own content, right? But if I him hauled around for the first like 20, 30 minutes on it, and like I've heard on some, some podcasts, it's, 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 it's not, I don't, I don't know if I'm in the right place. And also very consumers, if they're there for a hip injury and you're talking about the knee in the beginning or vice versa, if you're there for a knee injury and you talk about the hip in the beginning, it might be the right content for them, but they might think, mm, you're not talking about the knee. So you have to frame it. You have to frame it and make sure they know they're there for the right reason. And I think I said this earlier, but uh, I'm recording this on sequential days, actually, because I got busy yesterday, is no one cares really who you are. They don't care who you, uh, what you do at your clinic. They don't care about your education. In fact, I don't think anyone even cares that I have a degree. The only time I've ever had anyone ever ask me is when they came in and they thought I looked young in the video because that's where they experienced me first, is they went online and checked to make sure I actually had a advanced degree. They made, made, made sure I was licensed, which is fine. Um, but no one in the exam ever asked me, where did you come from? Who's your, who did you mentor under? What was your GPA in school? No one asked that stuff. They ask about them, which is rightfully so. They're here for solving their problems. They're on your YouTube videos and podcasts for their problems and solutions. They're on your content for their problems and solutions. So what you got to do, let's recap these things is number one is scratch your own itch because you're going to be really good at it. And even if no one watches this stuff, even if no one finds it on social media or on the websites, you're going to direct them directly to it. So at least you've duplicated yourself. Second is know who you're speaking to. If you can't speak in their terms and if you don't know where they hang out and if you don't know what types of uh, cues and uh, come froms they're going to relate to, then they might think, mm, this ain't for me. Third is learn that people learn in different ways. So they might like audio, they might like visual, and they might like uh, text. The funny thing with the story with this is uh, I, have, I had a podcast that I sent a guy, and he said, oh, yeah, I read it. It was great. And I was like, you read it? He's like, yeah. He's like, I read the transcript. I'm like, why? Why would you? Why would you? I put that as like a novelty. And he's like, no, I, uh, I read faster than most people can speak. I'm, I'm a speed reader, so I just do that because I get it done quicker. I'm like, oh, great, cool. More power to you. So apparently that works. And fourth is make sure that you know or you can you can map out at least what your target market, what your target audience, what your target patient, the flow of how they get to your content that you just created because you're scratching your own itch. Okay. Fourth, or sorry, fifth is write better material than anyone else that you found. I know that when f the just the conviction of sending someone to a subpar page or article, it would eat me up inside. And I don't really want to send them to someone else's page. I want them to send them to mine. And I know that I've, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, my Wikipedia experience and my, and my forum experience is that I don't, I don't see any point. If I'm talking about this certain topic and I wrote a badass article on it and it has a bunch of reference cita cited works on it, why would I send them to somewhere else? Because I'm passionate about this stuff. I'm passionate about what I've already written and what I've already podcasted. So I know for a fact what they're going to get in there is good. So you need to be passionate when you promote it. Content creation and promotion. Know who you speak to and you'll be just fine. Okay, so that's the show for today. If you're looking for the notes on this, this is going to be number, uh, I think, 103. So, But you can go to my website and put in five secrets to content creation or just content creation. I'm sure it's going to be the first podcast or link that pops up. Or whatever you're listening to this on, you just scroll down and I'm going to put a direct link in there. I hope. I am really bad at doing that uh, until sometimes it takes me a couple weeks later because I realize that I'm like, ooh, I didn't create that link yet. Anyways, so that is uh, it for today's show. Remember, if you're looking for any of the links or things that I mentioned in the podcast, go through to that note page and that's where the links will be. 
Lastly is leave people better than how you found them. And can you leave this podcast better than how you found it and actually review it? Go down and click five stars and then tell me what you loved about today's podcast. All right, talk to you guys soon. See you later.